let me start off. Um, thank you everyone uh, for coming in. My name is Adnan Kader. I'm currently working as an advocacy officer for the Water and Climate Campaign for Water in Bangladesh. I'll be moderating today's session uh, titled Bringing Community Voices in Water and Climate Camp uh, in Policy Discourse, hosted by Water Aid Bangladesh and the International Center for Climate Change and Development. Our session will be divided into three parts. So the first half an hour would be the storytelling round. The next half an hour would be the breakout room discussion. And lastly, we'll have a feedback round where we will also be taking your questions. So our session will look um, into how we can convert um, stories from the grassroots level into effective advocacy strategies and bridge existing gaps in the current status quo. We have three goals. Uh, winning the global argument uh, to use WASH as an effective climate adaptation strategy. The second goal would be how can we make climate finance more uh, inclusive, uh, especially through the lens of GCF, so that we can develop high level WASH adaptation bids in the future. And lastly, figuring out effective pathways for um, multi-sectoral collaboration or coalition to make our communities we are working for more resilience to climate change impact. Now, stories have existed for a long time, um, especially from communities. And today, our session will share four such stories. Uh, and we'll use that as a pathway for a discussion on how we can achieve the SAGE targets, as I mentioned earlier. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Hasin Jahan, who is the director for Water Aid Bangladesh. He's been working in the sector, on uh, the WASH sector for the last 25 years. Um, prior to joining uh, as country director for Water Aid Bangladesh, she was the country director for Practical Action. And she's been involved in other work with the government and other uh, partners as well. So without any further ado, Appa, um, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you please show the slides? Yeah. Chandler, can you go to the next one? Yeah. Yeah, please, next slide, please. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everybody. According to the Climate Change Index, Bangladesh ranks ninth among the most vulnerable countries. The frequency of extreme events has already increased. Average temperature has risen and the duration of winter period has shortened. There is sea level rise leading to increase in salinity both in river water as well as in soil. The climate change related phenomena are prominent in coastal belt of Bangladesh and over 30 million people across the coastal line are facing the consequence of climate change nowadays. The next slide please. Drinking water is a scarce in uh, coastal belt. The shallow uh, water aquifer, aquifer is contaminated with arsenic and iron, while the deep, deep aquifer is contaminated with salinity, except a few pockets of sweet or potable water. At the same time, river water is also saline due to its tidal effect, but it remains saline part of the year, not maybe all the time of the year. People mostly depend on pond water, which is basically the rainwater. They also use rainwater harvesting plants uh, at household level or community level. But these rainwater harvesting plants are not uh, uh, remain in operation around the year. So that's the problem. Next slide, please. Gender inequalities persist and men and women experience the impacts of climate change very differently. Let me explain a bit how climate change impacts differently for women. Women have to travel a few kilometers, which may take hours to collect water for domestic purpose. Girls drop out from schools to help their mothers. Women and girls suffer from sexual harassment while carrying water from uh, distant places at dark. Within such prevailing context, my story begins. Next slide, please. Tamina, a bold lady from Shamnapur, one of the coastal village, took the courage to set up a water business. 
She lives in a village, as I mentioned in the coastal area, which was washed away by Cyclone Isla in 2009. And all the ponds of that village were overthrown by the tidal surge during that cyclone. As a result, the villagers um, actually suffered, started suffering from having a safe potable water source and they depend on mostly on rainwater harvesting, and that is not a round layer solution. As a result, they have to fetch water from the neighboring villages during dry season. WaterAid and its partner, Rupantur, started working in that particular village um, under its HSBC funded project. During community consultation, Tahmina proposed to form a woman cooperative to run a water business provided the project can install a water technology for the villagers. Seeing the boldness, WaterAid and Rupantur, the partner in Jio, decided to go for this venture and a, rain, a reverse osmosis plant has been installed. She, I mean, Tahmina, led a woman cooperative and managed that water business. And she served the villagers that is the size of the villages about 300 households since March 2019 and at an at affordable rate while the profit is being shared among the committee members for the last one and a half years. She is serving the people of the village and at the same time created income opportunity for the entrepreneur group creating an example how women leadership can start. Now I will tell the next story that's about another lady. Can you please go for the next slide? Okay. My next case is about Gita. It's the tale of a daughter-in-law. Let me explain why I mentioned daughter-in-law under inverted comma. In our traditional culture, the daughter-in-law's role remains more suppressed. Her prime role is often expected to remain limited to household chores. Her voice should remain low and her aim in life should be making the family members and the extended family happy. But Gita made an exception. Gita got married and came to a coastal village of named Asashuni. She has two school going children a wash project of water aid along with its partner um, in Jio Rupantor started in that particular area and the project noted that the villagers are suffering from acute water crisis but they are unable to mobilize people and get a piece of land to install any RO, RO that is reverse osmosis plant. Rupantor made this lady Gita and found her very proactive and progressive minded and requested her whether she can help to organize a meeting with the villagers. Even being a so-called daughter-in-law, she took the challenge and courage to convince her family and arrange a meeting with the community members, I mean community villagers, and asked for sparing a piece of land. Sadly, none of them agreed, but she didn't give up. Along with two other ladies, she went to the, to the assistant headmaster of a school titled Tetulia and requested the assistant headmaster and the school committee whether they can spare a land for rural osmosis land. And finally, the school committee agreed and a river osmosis plant had been installed at the school premises and fillest villages started getting water from that plant. Seeing the perseverance, Gita had been given the opportunity to manage the water point, forming 10 member women entrepreneur group. Since then, I mean, from the last March, she is managing the plant, serving the villagers and earning money. And the entire women entrepreneurship group has been empowered through this process. So let me stop here and I'm giving the floor to Adnan. Thank uh, you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Hasinapa, for your insight. 
So, so far, um, just to reiterate for the people joining in right now, so we have three specific goals. Uh, we need to include WASH as an effective climate adaptation strategy. At the same time, learn from the communities um, who are working in the grassroots level, especially we have seen the women are taking the um, role there. So as a way forward from the stories from the water end, I would like to ask two questions to our participants so that um, as we move forward for the discussion session, we have these two questions in mind. The first being, how can we make women-led movements more inclusive? Secondly, how can we scale up such actions to bridge policy gaps in the future? At this point, I would like to introduce my colleague from the International Center for Climate Change and Development, Sharin Mannan, to share the next two stories. Um, please, Sharin, over to you. Thank you so much, Adnan and Hastinapa. I thought that was great the way Hastinapa has set the scene uh, at the beginning and then share the two stories. So from the stories, we have heard that how despite having a lot of uh, infrastructures and interventions in, in built, women, uh, particularly women, often face some, uh, often uh, are faced with some systemic barriers and challenges within the system that uh, hinders their way of uh, moving forward and access all those resources says they have to have a different struggle and different fight to achieve or attain all these issues. Uh, while uh, it is important to um, uh, consider the interventions and the infrastructures are in place, it is, it is also crucial to have uh, some sort of platform that provides the place for the local actors to speak and influence in the decisions making. Uh, at this point, I would like to introduce um, two stories and we will hear, hear from the local actors about two advocacy interventions that has been taken under the Pani Jibon, which is uh, Water is Life project, which is a project funded by Herbertus uh, Swiss Intercooperation and Climate Justice Resilience Fund. This is a multi-partner project and which also really focuses on the interventions on climate change and uh, water security and water aspects. So today we, will, we have uh, Mr. Shaukot Choudhury and uh, Ms. Sufia Begum with us today who will uh, speak uh, in Bangla and share their interventions of having these two advocacy platforms. Uh, so while they speak in Bangla, I will put the translation in the chat box and I, I'll also try to uh, summarize and wrap up their uh, interventions uh, very quickly by the end. Thank you. So Shaukot Pai, I'm going to start with you. Unmute Hello? Shokot Bhai, Shunta Batsina. Hello, Shokot Bhai? Um, I think he got disconnected for some reason. No, I think he's here. I can, I can see his video, but I don't think he yeah. can speak or maybe he's so, having Shokot difficulty Bhai? connecting. I think they're having microphone difficulties. Yeah. Karin, why don't you go to the next one? Um, I, I think I think in this case. Uh, I'm Zubair. I, I think in this case I can uh, help and a little bit contribute. Sure, yeah. Zubair, bhai, if you can, yeah. that would be great. I mean, if you could um, introduce Zubair, bhai, then we can start. Yes. Yeah. So um, uh, I see we have a bit of a technical difficulty connecting in with the local speakers. Now we have Mr. Zubair Hassan, who is the director at the uh, d development organization of the Rural Fort. Zubair, bhai, if you can kindly speak about the WASH Budget Monitoring Club at this moment and basically the interventions and outcomes. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharinapa. 
Uh, yes, um, I'm sorry about this uh, um, connection because so far I know this is the, uh, in Morel Gonj, there is a uh, free number of signal, maybe the connectivity problem. Anyway, uh, yes, uh, the budget club, as you know from the uh, name that it relates to the uh, money and it relates to the numbers, but uh, uh, the, the, these things has been translated in the ground in such a way that community people can engage in the process and they can uh, use the budgeting process as a uh, uh, intervention of uh, right to water and sanitation and ultimately um, uh, addressing their uh, wash needs. So uh, um, as uh, the introduction, Pani Jibon, which is in Bangla, but it's in, uh, Water is Life is one of the initiative undertaken by uh, Halvitas Bangladesh uh, with the partnership of uh, many other um, uh, partners, including ICAD. So this uh, wash budget uh, uh, has been undertaken as a, uh, as a uh, club, which is consisting of numbers of community leaders who are uh, ex-school teachers, uh, women leaders, youths, and uh, local uh, inhabitants, including marginalized so that a, uh, a group of people can come together and discuss their right to water and sanitation and ultimately advocate to the local authority. Because uh, uh, in Bangladesh, administratively, uh, Union Purishad, which is the lo lowest tier of the local government system, is the main uh, institution who is really working with the local people. So, uh, and they have a lot of um, allocation in relation to the health and other safety net programs, but there was not very much uh, focus on uh, water sanitation hygiene. So in this budget monitoring club has become a, uh, a catalyst in, uh, in, the, in the community level, and they started to discuss and um, uh, convince the local uh, um, uh, responsive or local authority and the duty bearers that um, see this is the uh, government commitment and there is the uh, um, uh, allocation which is coming in every year. So it's better to allocate water sanitation for the poorest of the poor so that they can uh, uh, avail or they can um, consume or they can uh, consider the water sanitation for the poor. And uh, this monitoring club also uh, lobby and advocate with the local uh, administration, which is called uh, sub-district level Upozela Purishad. In Upozela, in the government structure, there is WASH uh, standing committee and also in Union Purishad. So they are repeatedly or um, uh, frequently uh, asking the question and uh, discussing with them their, about their rights. So in the, in the last, um, and as you know, the project area where the Alvita is implementing through DORP and other uh, organizations. Uh, the uh, southwest of Bangladesh is Morel Gon, uh, one of the very climate vulnerable area. And those areas, particularly uh, water is saline and they, uh, only the source of water is uh, uh, surface water. And PS, the pond sand filter is one of the options of the surface water. And those uh, surface water and the ponds and filters are not uh, very cheap. It's a very costly and a lot of uh, households are sharing the same ponds for water. Uh, in my last um, uh, previous um, uh, presenter, Hasinabha was mentioning that how uh, women are collecting water from distance. So this uh, budget club is also advocating for better water supply in the ponds and PSF so that uh, uh, community can access the water properly and uh, um, uh, short distance. So as you saw in the uh, slides, the advocate for local water was need, monitor and track, wash budget, how much budget is coming, how, how they can increase the budget for particularly hygiene and wash and ensuring the proper uh, channelization of effective utilization of wash budget. For example, that uh, not putting the money in the drainage, uh, in, in the other non uh, uh, structural process rather than 
uh, uh, the PSA fonts and filter because uh, many of the fonts and filters of that areas are not functioning. Uh, once it is um, installed or established, but it is not properly functioning and people not uh, accessing because of uh, lack of operation and maintenance allocation. So the, on these issues, the budget monitoring club are mobilizing and also advocating with the local government. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, maybe later. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zawar. Sharin, so do you bhai wanna bhai. try? I Shafar think we to... have Shokot Bhai again. Shokot Bhai, you have to do it again. Do you want to do video to on the mic to open the mic? Shokot Bhai, do you want to do it again? Yes. Yeah, uh, in that case, Karin, if you do the next Yes, um, I yeah. think, yeah, they are facing a um, bit technical we are, difficulty. We, apo uh, we apologize for the technical difficulties. They, since they're from the community and they're in the rural level, uh, we have yeah. sometimes having difficulty connecting with them. Anyway, Sharin, um, if you do the next Hello? Yeah. Yes, uh, so maybe uh, next slide, Chandler, please. शकत भाई जी सम्भव है I guess I can I can uh, I can summarize the mother parliament and if we have Sufia maybe we can give. Yeah, yeah. Go on, go on, go on, Assalamu alaikum. I'm Anna Mushammad Sufia Bagam. I'm in Mashon Shadri Speaker, Morgan's Bagger. Go on, go on. I'm there. I'm there. Morgan's not the most rich dish. Upukuli onsu. I'm there. Onsu le jawbai yu kori porto ne karo me. प्राकृतिक दुर्योग दुर्योग शारिक समस्या जेमन पेटर पिठा चर्म रोग आमशा पतला पायखाना जर समस्या सदा सर इत्यादि समस्या है लवणा कारण विशिष्ट मा संसद गठन हो मा संसदे नयन सदस्य एक जन स्पीकार निर्वाचित कर इनियन पर सकल मे प्रकल्पित समस्या 
তারপর আমরা জেলা উপজেলা পর্যায়ে পিটিশন দাখিল করি পিটিশন দাখিল করার পর আমরা উপজেলা পর্যায়ে যত গণশুনানি অ্যাডভোকেসি সভা বাজেট সভা পরামর্শ সভা ওই সমস্ত ওই সমস্ত সবাই আমাদের মা সংসদকে মিটিং এই মা সংসদকে চিঠির মাধ্যমে দাওয়াত দেয় চিঠির মাধ্যমে দাওয়াত দিলে আমরা ওখানে আমাদের সমস্যার কথা উপস্থাপনা করি যে আমরা যে সমস্যা চিহ্নিত করে চিঠি এই চিঠির মাধ্যমে চিঠির মাধ্যমে আমরা উপজেলার সুপারিশপত্র জমা দিই সেই সুপারিশপত্র আমাদের অগ্রগতি কি তা নিয়ে আমরা বিভিন্ন সবাই আলোচনা করি বিভিন্ন সভায় আমাদের অ্যাডভোকেসি সভায় গণশুনানির মাধ্যমে আমরা উপস্থাপনা করি আমাদের এই কাজের অগ্রগতি কি তারপর আমরা ইতির মধ্যে মরুগঞ্জ উপজেলার ছয়টি ইউনিয়নে পানি স্যানিটেশনের পানি স্যানিটেশনের ইতিবাচক কিছু অর্জন আমরা করে করতে পারছি এলাকার পানি স্যানিটেশনের উন্নয়ন মান উন্নয়ন মা উন্নয়নের মান জেলা পরিষদ ও ইউনিয়ন জেলা পরিষদ ইউনিয়ন পরিষদ ডিপিআই সে হাতে বরাদ্দ করাতে পেরেছি তারপর আমাদের মা সংসদের উল্লেখযোগ্য কিছু উল্লেখযোগ্য কিছু অর্জন আছে আমি আপনাদের সামনে উপস্থাপনা করতে চাই আমরা চারটি পিএসএফ পিএসএফ সংস্কার করতে পেরেছি আমাদের মা সংসদ পিটিশনের মাধ্যমে যার ফলে তিন হাজার দুইশো পঞ্চাশটি পরিবার নিরাপদ পানি পান করছে এর বরাদ্দ ডিপিএসি এবং এডিপি বরাদ্দ দেয় এই এই কাজ এই কাজ করতে আমাদের অর্থ সাতাইশ হাজার সাতাশ লক্ষ আটষট্টি হাজার টাকা ব্যয় ব্যয় আমরা এই কাজ সম্পন্ন করতে পেরেছি তারপর আমরা তিন হাজার লিটার পানির ট্যাঙ্কি উনচল্লিশটি নব্বইটি পরিবারের মধ্যে বরাদ্দ করাতে পারছি তারপরে আমরা বিবি আফসার আলী মাধ্যমিক বিদ্যালয় পানি সরবরাহের জন্য মোটর পাম্পের সাহায্যে মোটর পাম্পের সাহায্যে ছাত্রীদের পানি সরবরাহের কাজ আমরা করাতে পেরেছি যার সদস্য সংখ্যা যার ছাত্রী ছয়শো আশি পরিবার ছাত্রীর সংখ্যা ছয়শো আশি পরিবার আশি জন যা আশি হাজার টাকা ব্যয় পিটিশনের মাধ্যমে এডিবির বরাদ্দ মাইন্ড <laughs> So just to sum summarize what Sufia has just said, she is a speaker uh, at the Mother Parliament, which is a platform for women, particularly for women advocacy. Uh, the, the area where she lives in, in um, Bagirhat district, which is uh, at the southwest coast uh, of Bangladesh, which is highly vulnerable to uh different disasters and particularly uh, in the face of climate change uh, it is increasingly be being faced with high intensity cyclones and salinity intrusion so uh, and uh, as we all know water sector is particularly vulnerable um, as particularly for these people who depend on natural resources like the river for their livelihoods and they basically do agriculture and fish farming so and the and the impacts on the uh, health of women is also very crucial at this point because women are often in charge of uh, collecting water and managing the household so they are often uh, dealing with the saline water which results in different um, skin diseases and different gastrointestinal diseases and even in some cases some pregnancy related issues so considering all these issues these local community women have um, uh, uh, as a as a part of its support from pani jivan project has established this women advocacy platform which is called the mother parliament where women uh, young girls and um, particularly the, uh, elderly women and widowed women who often don't when often don't get chance to uh, get heard of 
um, you know, come together uh, and sits uh, uh, once in a month and talks about all these women's specific needs and challenges and what are the interventions that are required. One interesting outcome that she has highlighted is salinity is one of the important um, factors and major um, major disaster that 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 these communities face. And uh, in some cases, the ponds and the ponds and filters that they have are, are often not well managed, and they require re-excavation and all that. So basically, through the mother parliament, they have they have issued a petition at the local authority to re-excavate the canal so that um, at least it doesn't increase the level of salinity coming out of uh, the leakages from the uh, nearby um, shrimp farms. So they have uh, uh, put the petition and issued the petition to the local authority. And after a lot of back and forth and series of dialogues and lobbying, they have finally been able to um, get the rear pond re-excavated. And now um, they kept on continuing uh, all these advocacies. Um, and this way, they also get a platform to raise their voice and influence the decision making. Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed uh, what uh, Sufia and uh, Zobar Bhai has summarized about these two advocacy platform. Now I would like to hand it over to Adnan. Thank you so much. Um, Chandler, thank you, Sharin. Thank you, everyone who joined to share their stories. Chandler, if you go to the next slide. Again, um, time and time again, we are seeing, um, please go back to the previous slide, please. Uh, um, time and time again, we're seeing uh, women-led communities taking the lead in their communities, especially uh, um, to bring interventions for the wash sector, at the same time um, tackling the adverse effects of climate change. Again, in addition to the two questions we prompted at the beginning of our presentation, we have two additional questions. Um, that being, how can we scale up local policy advocacy for women-led institutions? And the second one is, which actors can make wash climate financing more wide ranging? Again, we are uh, looking into how we can use wash as an effective strategy for um, climate adaptation, uh, both nationally and globally. So now we're at the end of uh, our storytelling round. Um, now we'll go into the breakout session. Um, so our uh, volunteers will be putting you into the breakout room we would ask facilitators to assist. And so we, in the chat, um, you will see who will be leading the breakout room. So as that happens, um, just give us some time so, um, while our volunteers will be putting you in the breakout room. Thank you so much. Um, Sharin, should I start yes, the next? Yes, please. Bit? Okay, um, I would, Ask the moderators. Uh, we have some people coming in still. So, um, Sharin, do you want to start? Um, any interesting insights from your sure. you would like to share? Thank you so much, Adnan. So as you all know that the breakout room was decided to identify a few strengths, weakness, um, opportunities, threats within the local actors so that we can identify the gaps and put them in a position and enable them so that they can be the influencers in future. So while addressing, we have a couple of really, really good and interesting points and everyone was really active throughout the session. So during the strength session, what ex interesting point was that the communities not only know about their community, the priorities, their needs, they also are very, very well, um, you know, aware of the service providers within their community. So that can be an interesting strength for them as well, so that they know and can quickly go and access the support they require or, or, the, or the services they demand from the service providers. In terms of weaknesses, although uh, the speakers in our group had, a, a, I, I completely agree with them, the word weakness is not, uh, you know, uh, right for them, you know, and a, a lot of systemic barriers often become a weakness for the communities themselves. For example, the power dynamics within the system and the relationships is a, it can be a, a weakness for them. And also their poor access to technologies and improved devices often becomes a weakness for them. 
uh, in terms of opportunities, one interesting point, we all know that the opportunity they have, their, their, their potential to collaborate with NGOs, governments, private sectors, but one interesting opportunity that came in my group was the, the, the opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer learning. You know, within the within different districts, within the communities, or even among the countries, nearby countries, there is a very good chance of peer-to-peer -peer learning and adopting the technologies and adaptation measures, the community-based adaptation measures. So um, uh, we thought that was a very interesting opportunity. And in, ter in terms of threats, the, again, uh, we have preferred the word challenges over threats. One of the important challenges that was highlighted is the effective flow of fund within the system. And um, again, you know, the concern of not being heard, uh, you know, anymore. So that, that is an interesting week, uh, the challenge and um, thread within the system. In terms of key actors, one interesting point was raised that uh, local schools and school communities uh, can be a very effective key actor in this regard to get their voices heard, to disseminate their information. And in terms of uh, considering the issues, one important factor was that the effective channelization, the, the, the people should consider, and also the issue of you know account accountability, particularly the willingness of the local service providers to hear uh, from the community. They should have the willingness to you know co-create solutions. So that's all from my end. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Taki Bhai. Um, if you could summarize your room or Sohal. Thank you very much, muted. Sorry, I, I thought I'd unmuted it. Uh, Shohel, could you maybe no. put up the SWOT analysis? So I, I think we had quite a lot of points that resonated with the Sharin's group as well, sort of understanding the sort of power dynamics and uh, local actors that the communities need to be working on. And I think in sort of building up with some of the prompts that we put into the slides, that, that really uh, resonated with some of the uh, discussions that we were having in terms of local communities being a little bit more uh, embedded within the need. You know, the local communities are often the ones that are where we're getting the demands from the projects, which is a very good thing that we know what the, the project and activities are demand driven. But then it's also about the, the local communities are a lot more invested in the agenda of getting that need uh, met. So I think, I think in terms of both understanding the demand and the uh, uh, commitment for seeing that through, that was a common uh, strength that we were sort of focusing on. Uh, also looking at some of the ways that communities are a little bit more responsive. Oftentimes they're the ones right there at the impact level before any other actors can really mobilize themselves, get themselves uh, geared towards working towards the activities and impacts. So again, that's, that's the strength that we were looking into how we could turn that into an opportunity, then being a little bit more responsive, a little bit more effective. And uh, we had some talks about how oftentimes working with local communities, that's, that's uh, a lot more cost effective for the project in, all, in general. So again, in terms of uh, looking at when you're doing sort of maybe uh, national budgeting or donor driven projects, in terms of cost effectiveness and value for money, that's something that's to consider. It's not uh, whether you invest in uh, uh, other actors to be coming in and working at the local level. Working with the local communities, again, gives you that demand driven, but then also gives you a better value for money in the project. So maybe that might be an opportunity that we could be taking forward. Uh, we had some talk about how to uh, effectively channelize funding at the local level. So again, uh, one of our comments was about how oftentimes local levels, uh, local communities specifically lack the knowledge and access for going for bigger funding, whether there was our international funding mechanisms, sometimes even national budget funding. So again, the opportunity is to be investing in the knowledge and uh, developing those sort of cap uh, capabilities within the community and using other uh, um, financial institutions, microfinance institutions in Bangladesh being a case study that can be a good way of effectively channelizing uh, climate finances because oftentimes, even if the uh, local communities aren't able to access anything, a microfinance institution is something that they're able to take a micro loan from. So then again, a bigger channel and bigger international funding might be difficult, but then what are some of the other private sector entities that we could be working with? We had some talk about how uh, building uh, uh, linkages with academic sectors, specifically in local schools and colleges, that might be a good way of building the sort of resilient knowledge within the communities. And again, uh, one of the points that I was sort of putting towards is uh, working with local communities specifically earlier on, 
develops the resilience of the community rather than them only being adaptive to something, something has to happen and they're going and uh, repairing a flood embankment or a pond or a polder. It's not only an adaptive, uh, reactive sort of measure, working with the communities beforehand can actually build their resilience. They know what's happening beforehand. They're aware of sort of things that are happening beforehand. So capacity building in that element might be something that we could also consider as a step forward. Um, I think we can, uh, if I've missed anything overarchingly, if anybody would like to come in, Shohal, you're other. I think those, those are excellent points. I think um, comparing to the group discussion we had, I think we had some similar insights. I think most of um, the local level interventions often are being missed out because there is no proper um, channeling of their ideas to the global level or their local authorities as well. I think mm -hmm. those are the key challenges everyone is facing and it's a good that those things came out in two different groups. Um, Saki Pai, um, if you are still like to continue, um, you have the floor or we can move, move on to the next I, breakout. I think we're okay for this. If we hear from some of the other breakouts, we can come back in the discussion if we need. Sure, sure. Um, Thank you. Sashya, Sashya um, if you would like to come in. Uh, Stagbhai will do the summary from sure, our sure, session. No problem, no problem. Stagbhai? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Adnan. Uh, so we had a similar discussion, despite of some uh, technical difficulties, we really had a good discussion among ourselves. Uh, the points are a bit similar that my colleagues already have mentioned, but a uh, few addition that I want to mention is like in, this, uh, in the point of strengths, what one of the, our uh, discussion was the local people are more acceptable in the local communities, and that's why they had a good influence uh, in the communities, in their own community. That's why that is kind of one of their main strength. Uh, some of the weakness is uh, lack of uh, understanding of these uh, specific issues like climate change. In a lot of cases, uh, we have seen that the local people, they don't have a clear idea what climate change is and that kind of comes up as a weakness or like challenge for them. At the same time, they have limited opportunities to raise their voice, even though a lot of organizations are kind of working at the community level uh, to have their voice at different levels, but still they don't have uh, like uh, the opportunity that they should have. They have a limited opportunities. Uh, in, the, uh, uh, in terms of opportunities uh, that we see is if we kind of train them to build their capacity and conduct uh, different activities that can be a good opportunity for them to have, will have a good understanding of the uh, topics. At the same time, the NGOs can play a role to facilitate and linkage uh, their the community level to the local, national level in decision making. The third that we see is uh, one is the political interference. Uh, a lot of time, uh, the political uh, leaders, they have uh, their, a role, negative role to play in this uh, process. At the same time, uh, the power imbalance, the power imbalance that we have uh, with the local community and the policy makers, that plays a kind of negative role in this way. At the same time, vested interest, even uh, a community is not a homogeneous and that a different group has a different agency. So sometimes the local elites with uh, the business interest uh, kind of comes up as a threat to this process. Some key actors that we think uh, is from the, our group is like local institutions, definitely the local Indian Purishad, Upazila Purishad, uh, and the local healthcare center, health complex, at the same time, Department of Public Health, uh, Water Resource Management, they play a uh, vital role in this process. Uh, in terms of uh, things to consider, uh, what we think is really important, uh, effective channelization of fund. At the same time, as Sharin mentioned, transparency and accountability will play a big role to formulate the process in form of, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Adnan. And uh, no if anyone else uh, has anything to add. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, especially participants, you can please write them down in the chat box. We'll get back to you after the feedback. Um, at this point, I would like to Arusa to summarize the breakout room uh, from our end. And at the same time, after Arusa, I would ask Dr. Hoth, since he was present in the room, to share his thoughts. Arusa, over to you. Hi, everyone. So at this point, I think I don't have anything um, really uh, new to say. But however, out of the top of my mind, I know um, besides discussing what has already been discussed till now, uh, I know we talked about um, 
the fractured nature of the government departments where each government departments have their own um, agendas and viewpoints. And oftentimes it seems that um, because of that, the local uh, change makers cannot really um, go in and make a difference. So, um, and then another uh, key thing that we discussed also was formalizing the informal groups. So oftentimes we know that in community places, we have a lot of, com um, a lot of associations or groups that are informal. So, um, but um, whoever is present in that group are very influential. They have the means to make change. Um, however, they don't really have that authority. So by formalizing them, um, we can give them the access to really make a change in their community. Um, and uh, besides this, I think I will give the floor to Dr. Hawk so that he can go over uh, the points that he talked about. Um, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Hawk, if you could come in, I think you shared some really insightful thoughts in our group. I would request you to share that with the larger participants present here right now. Thank you very much, Adnan. So just to um, repeat my reflection within the group, uh, to me, there are three big challenges that uh, we need to be thinking about, all of us collectively, and not just this particular session, but all the sessions of the CBA. Uh, the first one is how do we, and by we, I mean all of us are not the grassroots communities. We are outsiders associated with some grassroots communities. What role can we play to assist the grassroots communities to enable them to be more effective in the activities that they do in this particular case, access to water, use of water, but in the larger context, adaptation to climate change going forward. And we've got some very good examples of NGOs doing things, academics doing things. Um, and what we now need to think about is how do we make the outcomes of all of these activities more effective going forward? And there are several things that we can do. One, all of them have been discussed here. so this is not anything new, is how do we empower people? And empowerment requires organization, it requires collective action, it requires uh, connecting people from different locations together so that they can act together to influence decision-making, initially uh, primarily within the local uh, decision-making structures and the national decision-making structures. But for this particular conference, what I would like us to all think about and, and hopefully take out from the conference and take forward after CBA 14 is over in the next few days is how do we take this to the global level? How do we link up with each other, uh, grassroots groups, people working with grassroots groups in different localities, countries, towns, rural areas, uh, continents? How do we connect with each other and how do we stay connected to each other and how do we take forward at the global level, these different uh, advocacy items and evidence-based uh, information and, and uh, knowledge that we are producing uh, together with local communities. That to me is the big challenge. We have not been able to do that so far. So my, my question all the time when I listen to all of this is, how can we make that happen? Are there thoughts that we can bring together to make our collective action, globally collective action, of the grassroots community is more effective. In this particular context, obviously, water, water has have, uh, and wash has a very, very big role to play in adaptation to climate change. Almost anything to do with adaptation has to do with water at the same time. So these are in integrally linked, they, you can't de-link them. So it's very relevant for the community-based adaptation uh, agenda to talk about wash and water as well. So thank you all, everybody, for uh, excellent discussions. Uh, I really enjoyed being part of it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Hawk, for your insights. Um, at this point, we'll be taking questions. Um, we have really good panel members from the community level at the same time from WaterAid and in the International Center for Climate Change and Development. So um, if you have any questions, you can use the raise hand feature. We can give you the floor. At the same time, we you can type in the questions in the chat box. Um, we can uh, from the question to our experts um, afterwards. So I'll just give one minute. If you have any questions, please use the raise hand option. 
We also have some questions that came in earlier. We can um, directly jump into that as well. Do you have any, I think Olivia had a comment. Olivia, would you like to prompt that question to the panel? Uh, yeah, so it was more more just a point than a question, but around uh, where we were uh, talking about informal and formal communities. Um, and uh, I mean, obviously, I can only speak from Cape Town perspective, but I think Bangladesh possibly has similar uh, situation as well, where the inform informal communities are kind of considered like an other, that they're not um, necessarily kind of embraced as, um, as you know, part, part of... Um, Part of the society um, and unless that happens I'm not sure that they're you know the, the voices of the informal communities um, are you know going to be listened to and respected and I'm, I'm not I don't know what the answer is to that to be honest <laughs> um, it's a big it's a big problem that's bigger than um, you know obviously that we can solve yeah. today but I just think it's an interesting uh, problem um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Olivia. I think that's a really interesting question. I think thought provoking question, I might say. And I think everyone should, um, like me moving forward, uh, we should all figure out um, carrying on to Dr. Hawk's point and also your point. Um, we have a um, hand raised from Sakib Bhai. Um, Sakib Bhai, if you could. I think sort of related to that as well, we had a, a point about oftentimes at the local level, uh, specifically um, uh, local um, water issues, it's often the women of the household and the community that are the ones that are uh, in charge of dealing with the problems and sort of uh, figuring out what to do with it, I've just seen from some of our case studies as well. So I think one of the points uh, that we had about being inclusive about that is not only sort of looking at them as being a sort of end beneficiary of a project, but then including them into the planning and the design stages as well. So that your your project is a, able to sort of target the local community needs as well as be gender responsive right from the beginning from the planning and the onset of it and then building that forward into the structures of the project i think is a much better um, perhaps more effective way of going ahead with the project rather than having to retrofit these sorts of considerations and inclusivity issues later on once the project is already designed and integrated thank you thank you sakib bhai i think sumiti had a really um good point in the chat box regarding convergence of wash problems and solution with climate adaptation. Um, Sumiti, would you like to prompt that question? I would like Hasina Par to come in and give her insight on that. Sumiti? Um, sure, thank you, Adnan. I um, basically felt that um, I think from a technical as well as um, academic circles, these two domains have been kept a, a bit apart because WASH, um, again, may have a solution space, which is both technological as well as, you know, te technologically dependent and derived, as we heard, you know, with the RO plant, plants in Bangladesh, as well as an ecosystem element. So uh, both in terms of solutions, as well as approaches, WASH and uh, climate adaptation have not really been seen as uh, parallel processes or, or not. They have been seen as parallel, but as converging processes. So maybe some awareness building is required um, in that uh, domain uh, to, to build the interlinkages, I would say, at, at a very practitioner and community level um, understanding. But as I was listening to the conversation, especially Olivia, talking about um, formalizing the informal communities, engagements, et cetera. I think I just wanted to raise this element of Cape Town and South Africa, particularly where crime impedes a lot of people from engaging with informal settlements because of the history of the country, which may not be the same in all countries, but definitely it's a very, very, uh, critical element here because I know researchers who worked in informal settlements and the strategies that they then employ so that they can be tracked by colleagues and friends all the time, you know, uh, through G GPS. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I, that's the thing that I was saying about how different cities have their own contexts that one then has yeah. to fit in. So I appreciate that um, the point that uh, uh, Salim raised about connecting to global discourses, and yet we are also very much entrenched in our local um, context, so. 
Yeah, so um, you had an in interesting question regarding the convergence of WASH problems and solution with climate adaptation. I think it's um, a very important can point. Can I that... quickly comment? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry. So uh, I particularly, uh, during my breakout session, I had Mr. Zubair Hassan within the session, and he raised out a, a very quite a few interesting points, like he has been working in this sector for quite a while and has been closely linking uh, the grassroots voices with the local and national uh, national and subnational actors maybe i can quickly ask uh, zobar bhai if you can um, hear us uh, and if you can share how the exactly the challenges are in place and what you think can be the solutions to you know uh, include the local actors and uh, merge with the national and uh, subnational government if you can quickly in two three minutes summarize yeah. thank you Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think uh, we had a lot of discussion and all the distinguished participants, they uh, already uh, know their uh, point of view, but as a local implementing organizations and as we are directly communicating with the local people and already uh, two of them uh, have uh, participated. And uh, today's uh, caption of our session is local solution and uh, inspiring local action. So uh, solution, I think it, it depends, but very difficult at some point. But what we have found that uh, community know, uh, what we have learned that community know what they should do. Only we need to create some enabling environment uh, that what to do in relation to the water sanitation hygiene, particularly for their need, as well as the climate, uh, 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 responsive uh, initiative. And also, accordingly, we need to have uh, create the facilitation. Uh, for example, making the opportunities, huh? because uh, they don't know where to go and appeal for water and sanitation. Government are uh, saying at the national level that we have the pro poor strategy, we have a sufficient budget allocation, we have uh, numbers of uh, PSF related projects, local rural uh, water, and we have separate ministry, uh, 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 environment and climate uh, change ministry. So, but local people don't know. We need to create info, uh, enabling environment so that they can get the proper information, how much budget is coming for them and how they can uh, receive it and how they can best utilize it. Uh, and also uh, particularly uh, focusing on inclusive and gender responsive budget because uh, uh, all of we know that uh, water is very much related to the gender issue and it is uh, it should be inclusive and uh, and in in the first presentation as well as uh, uh, dr hawk also mentioned that the the empowerment uh, needs to come from somewhere that is important very much important because without giving uh, empowerment or giving the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rights or duties at the local level, uh, we are just putting the top-down approach, it will not work. The solution should come from the local level, we have to explore. And lastly, what we would like to say that uh, from our uh, 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 implementing uh, project, what we have seen, that resources are not going at the local level. Huh? all it is stuck at the national level. For example, in the SDG approach, we know the per capita allocation, uh, 1200 taka. It's, it's a, a planning commission estimated budget, which is 12 euro per capita. But is this enough for the local community? Have we uh, uh, assessed any time or have we discussed at the local level? We know the corruption and the accountability issue also, but Top of that, we need to think the local need, creating the enabling environment and giving them the chance to export the budget. And, and that, that's what uh, Pani Jivon is trying to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Zobar Bhai, for your insight, um, in, interesting insight on that take. Um, at this point, since we're at the end of our session, I would like Hasin Appa to come in. Firstly, I would request Appa to share her insight about both the overall session and her findings. And then I would ask her to give the closing remark. But um, before everyone um, leaves after the closing re remarks, I would request everyone to turn on their video. We'll take a picture before your 
allowed to let go of the to the end of today's session. Appa, if you could come in. Um, Thanks. Thank you. So I'll be very brief, just to say a few words. One about that climate, uh, the climate impacted areas. Um, water solution is not neither easy nor cheap. We have to understand that. And the technological solution, whatever we give them, that is uh, high cost and the operation and maintenance require high, uh, high cost as well. And if we engage the local community, the overall operational cost may minimize. So that is another point to understand and consider for future. And my third point is political commitment is a must. So flow of resource will be there if political commitment is there, so we, we cannot ignore that. And the last point is gender responsive and gender inclusive planning is essential. And uh, let me move on to my closing remark. And at the outset, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Salimun Hoff, Director of ECAC, for attending the session. And uh, I really thank you for his presence. And I would also like to thank Zubair Hassan, Director research planning monitoring of uh, DOR, uh, monitoring director of DOR. And I would like to thank Shaukot Chaudhary, who is the Upazila coordinator of DOR, and uh, Sufia Begum, speaker of Mother, Mother Parliament. And lastly, I would like to thank all, all the audience for attending the CBA conference, especially our session, uh, Sharin, Adnan, Sakit, and all the moderators who attended the breakout session. And uh, as my last remark, I would like to say one thing and, and give an example, actually. I have heard Shaharin was telling several times and she was asking for apology because of the technical difficulties. But this is here I want to emphasize a point that you can see that often we talk about community and the community remains missing. And here is the platform, online Zoom platform, and we try to bring the community present here with us. And we had technical glitch. And everywhere this, is, this happens, that when we want to bring the community, make them inclusive, we, we encounter several problems. And we have to accommodate them, and we have to bear with this. So I, I, I really thank everybody to bear with us. And we have to understand that if we want to make the inclusive planning, then we have to accommodate like this. And we have to accept the reality and we have to tailor our intervention, our project like this, like today we have managed the situation. So thanks everybody. And we hope that we can in, uh, go for inclusive planning like today. Thank you very much for attending today's session. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Appa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hawk. Thank you, Zobar Bhai, for joining the session today. So before everyone leaves, please turn on your video. We're going to make it fun. We're going to take a quick picture before everyone can leave. Volunteers, if you could take a screen screen or a picture. Um, Ruksar, are you taking it? Uh, yeah, so, if, the, if, if people, all of them could turn on their mics, I see some of them are still uh, not on video. Thank you. Okay, everyone's here. Yep, I got most of the photos. <laughs> Only a few are still not on camera, but I think we're good. Most of them are. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, listening. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for participating. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed the session. And for, thank you so much for your active participation.